Hey there, this is Dr. Justin Marcajani, and today's talk is going to be on H. pylori infections. This is one of the most common infections that I see in my practice, and we're going to outline what is H. pylori, how do we test it, how do we treat it, and again, what can it do? How, what kind of problems can it cause in our body? And again, a lot of the symptoms that we tend to see, especially with gut infections, may not be intestinally based. It may not be the conventional diarrhea, bloating, gas, constipation that most people are associated with. Also, most mainstream medical uh, personnel, they, they find that parasite infections in general are something that's isolated to the third world countries. We tend to see that, you know, distended belly or lots and lots of diarrhea or lots and lots of digestive pain. And you may just be somewhere in the middle or you may even be asymptomatic. You may have symptoms like brain fog or just low libido or neurological pain. Um, or just indigestion, or just low energy. So again, these symptoms may not be 100% connected. So we want to have a way in which we can use functional medicine, which is a field of medicine that looks at using specialty testing to get to the root cause of what's driving these issues so we can remove the underlying stressors so you can heal. So again, your body's set on autopilot to heal, right? But if we have chronic infections or underlying stressors like blood sugar issues or environmental toxicities or chronic infections or sleep issues or hormonal imbalances, that's like holding the e-brake on your car and trying to accelerate, right? You're getting nowhere fast. Or if you're running, it's like having a parachute on your back. Maybe good for training, but not good for living your everyday life. So let's break it down here. What is H. pylori? H. pylori is a gram-negative bacteria. Now, Anyone that's taken um, college level microbiology may know what that is, but most people aren't. So gram negative versus gram positive. Those are the only two kinds of bacteria we have. Gram negative has two walls, gram positive has one wall. That's important. So imagine we have to go scale one wall. It's gonna be a lot easier scaling that one wall and getting over it than it is knocking out two walls. So here's H. pylori here. Here's the first wall, number one. And here's the second wall, number two. So I tell my patients, think of it as like trying to scale the castle wall. But before you scale the castle wall, we have to go over the moat, right? The drawbridge is up, so we have a moat with alligators and all kinds of things in there that's a deterrent. And then we have the second wall, we have to, which we have to climb as well. So when we knock out these infections, the typical antibiotic protocol, so for H. pylori would be Prevpac. That's typically a proton pump inhibitor like um, Omniprazole or like a Nexium, and then we would use like a uh, clarithromycin or an amoxicillin or a bismuth, something like that to knock it out. Again, those protocols last about 10 to 14 days and there's lots of side effects, right? And let's go over why. So we have one and two walls. So we have something in between the first and second wall known as an efflux pump. And think of an efflux pump as the body's ability or the bacteria's ability of taking antibiotics, so here's your antibiotic right here, we'll entitle it AB. The antibiotic comes in just like so, and the body has the ability of taking it and shooting it right back out. Now that's a problem, because if we push the antibody, antibiotic back out into the um, gastrointestinal area, we're gonna have a lot more side effects. We want it to go in here and penetrate deep and go into the second wall and cause destruction, right? That's the goal. But if we have these efflux pumps pushing it back out, that's not good. Now, in my opinion, that's why we wanna use two month, 60 day herbal medicine protocols because one, the herbs aren't gonna have as many side effects and two, we can wear it down by just doing it week after week after week and we can eventually wear down this mechanism and knock out the H. pylori with very little side effects. So again, that's why the antibiotics tend not to be as successful. And then also, really important, the main reason why we have a lot of issues with H. pylori is because these little critters here, these little guys at the end, these are called endotoxin, otherwise known as LPS, lipopolysaccharide. And just like it says, I'm gonna underline that word toxin, it's literally hepatotoxic on your liver and on your body. Again, funguses in your body produce mycotoxins. There's lots of different toxins that are produced by various infections. We call them endo, meaning they're produced within the body. 
So that's the main reason why H. pylori tends to cause lots of issues. So if we use an herbal medicine protocol, we can bypass these efflux pumps right here, and we can eventually wear it down, kind of like a war of attrition, if you will, where instead of winning the war in 10 to 14 days, we're winning the war over a couple of months. Much safer, much less side effects. And again, anyone that has a gut infection, I typically recommend there's got to be preparation before we go into addressing the gut. We have to stabilize the adrenals, stabilize blood sugar, really get an anti-inflammatory diet dialed in, get sleep dialed in because dealing with infections can be very stressful on the body. Again, what can it do? Right? We can see a whole bunch of issues here. So this is your, your gut lining. This is the lining that lines your gut. It protects it. H. pylori comes in like this, and you can imagine, here's your H. pylori, little critter here. It comes in and it can burrow into the tummy like that, and it can eventually wear away the lining like so, and it can actually come in there and create more inflammation in the gut. Now that's not good. What H. pylori also does is it takes urea in the gut, so H. pylori, produces an enzyme called urease. Now you know it's an enzyme because it ends in ASE. That's just, you know, biochem right there. ASE means enzyme. Now we have urea in the gut. I'm going to just put some U's here. That's urea. And what happens with urea? When urea gets hit by urease, it breaks urea down. So again, we're going to look at urease hitting urea, and then what happens? It gets broken down into CO2, and it gets broken down into ammonia. Now, this is the really important part because ammonia has a pH of 11. So if we put a whole bunch of ammonia there, that's a pH of 11. The pH of the stomach needs to be around 2. So we have a pH here around 2, 2, and if we come in there and we throw this 11 pH in there, guess what happens to our pH? It starts going up. The pH starts going up. pH increases. If the pH increases, what's going to happen is we're going to have decreased hydrochloric acid. We're going to have decreased protein enzymes, protein digesting enzymes such as pepsin. This is important because if we can't activate these enzymes, we're not going to be able to break down the protein. And if we can't break down the protein, we're also going to have increased dysbiosis. That means lots of bad bacteria in the gut. So really important, we have this downward spiral that's happening here. H. pylori is breaking urea. This is coming from protein, right? That's coming from protein. It's creating more CO2 and more ammonia, and it's raising the pH in our stomach, which is disrupting digestion and causing lots of bad bacteria. So we have this ratio of high amounts of bad bacteria and low amounts of good bacteria. So now the infection connection here, when, we, when we're diagnosing H. pylori, one of the gold standards is stool testing, because we can actually find the H. pylori molecule in the stool. That's great. A lot of the other methods are indirect. We're not actually looking for a piece of H. pylori. We're looking for a byproduct of H. pylori. So in the blood, we may look at various antibodies, IgG, IgA, IgM. IgA and IgM are diagnostic of an active H. pylori infection. So we have A, G, and M. And the best ones are going to be M and A for the blood. And then we also have a breath test, which is... Again, we're looking at CO2 production from, we're taking this glucose drink, we're looking for the extra CO2 production. Why is that? Let's go back to what H. pylori does. H. pylori causes what? An increase in CO2 and an increase in ammonia. So what we're doing is we're looking for an increase of this CO2 byproduct with the breast test. And that's how that works. And then also endoscopies, we're coming in there with a, with a uh, um, endoscopic unit down the throat, and we're trying to clip little pieces of the intestinal tract, and we're trying to see if we can actually pick up H. pylori in the tissue. The problem with this is, it's like taking a bucket of water, dipping it into the ocean, pulling it up, and saying, oh, there are no fish in that bucket. That means there's no fish in the ocean. Now, erroneously, we know that's just not true. It's, I mean, obviously, there's fish in there. We just maybe not have gotten a sample of that fish, and it's the same thing with the endoscopy and H. pylori. 
So again, recap, gram-negative bacteria, two cell walls. Very hard to get over the moat and the drawbridge. Herbal medicines tend to do the best. What can it do? It decreases protein digestion, decreases HCL, and increases chance of dysbiosis and other future infections. Again, how we test for the infection connection is outlined here. And also, one more thing, H. pylori is actually proven um, to increase thyroid antibodies. So here's your thyroid, which is draw in a different color here. Here's your thyroid like this. Your thyroid is the gland that controls your metabolism. And studies have actually shown that when we remove the H. pylori infection, we decrease thyroid antibodies. We decrease thyroid antibodies, which means we decrease the destruction of the thyroid gland. So it's essential because 80 to 90 percent of all thyroid issues are autoimmune in origin. And we have the most common bacterial infection, H. pylori. And if it's the most common bacterial infection and the most common thyroid infection, and we see if we remove H. pylori, thyroid antibodies drop. I think everyone can see the infection connection and how important it is to getting to the root cause of a thyroid issue. So we really want to get the, the, the H. pylori eradicated to really knock the thyroid antibodies down. And that will decrease the destruction to the thyroid tissue. So that's a lightning bolt right here coming at the thyroid, attacking it. And we can decrease that. We can decrease it if we knock down the H. pylori infection. So again, this is Dr. Justin here. Feel free and subscribe below the video to my various newsletters. I have a thyroid newsletter, a video report, as well as a female hormone video report. And again, there'll be more videos coming soon. Subscribe below so you can stay up to date with the most current information. Thanks. Have a great day.